Yes, yeah, see yes. Can. Yay, Yay, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Are we coming through your earphones now? Yeah. Ah, cool. What's awesome. You kept talking at me and I was like, no, I don't know what you're saying, but you're waving and I wanted to wave. But then I'm like, oh, that means that I know what I'm, I'm successful, which I wasn't. Um, <laughs> It's amazing. We can like it can get so complicated. Like, do I wave and but then I, then they think I can hear them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, I'm just gonna ignore you and just. Make oh, you classic. <laughs> cool. Hey, yeah, good. Thanks, and uh, you. Nice yeah, to meet nice. you, Heather. Yeah, nice to meet you. Are you, uh, <laughs> and you like you keep telling yourself it's not a competition. It's not a competition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you're like, I want to be able to do that, what that old lady's yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's so hard. Every time I go, I'm like, how is this this hard? Yeah. Like, you know, ridiculous. Okay. Is it indoors or outdoors? Okay. Outdoors. Ah, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. They've just been a refurb on it. And I keep going up to it and like looking in and then being like, yes, yeah, one day. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm an absolute wasp when it comes to cold. <laughs> it's from Ireland. You must be used to it. Come on. Yeah, I know. I know. I need to, yeah. I need to grow a thicker skin, but I, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm <so wasp. laughs> you thought you'd move to the balmy weather of London. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You, you're up there with the top three or four of the most organized people we've had in terms um, of like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you make sure that goes on the podcast? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, edit, we'll make sure we don't cut that stuff out. <laughs> oh, wow. I wasn't recording. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a shame. Um, and and is, it's McKee, is that right? Or McGee? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. McKee. McKee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I was listening to a podcast you were on uh, the other day, this lady, um, I forget the name of the podcast now. Um, I th- yeah, and she, I think she was like McGee, so. I know, everyone yeah. does that. <laughs> but it's McKee, I mean, hey? Yeah, and I okay. always feel like, I'm one of these people, I'm like, I don't want them to feel like a dick because I know myself, like when I <laughs> say someone, you know, when someone corrects you, you're always Ooh, yeah. like, oh, sorry. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm always, I just kind of roll with it and... Yeah. Yeah. Okie doke. Well, good morning there, Dr. Heather McKee from London. How's it going? How's your day going? Thanks for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. So, Heather, uh, I was actually. Uh, put in contact with you through a common friend, Bella Hanratty, probably about, I don't know, over a year ago now. And him and I did the, the Alt MBA together with uh, Seth Godin. And um, yeah, and then like, you know, we just, his and our friendship just blossomed off the back of that. We just had like lots in common and he was a great guy, he's a great guy. And then, yeah, like, it's just so cool how he put us in touch. And then now we have you here as a guest on uh, the Ridiculously Human podcast. Yay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so Heather, you're an absolute expert in uh, what you do, um, but part of our podcast is we actually like to find out a bit of people's backstory, Ooh. and um, you were obviously born in Ireland. Um, yeah. Can you just maybe give us a little bit about your backstory and sort of where things began for you? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, born in Ireland. It's quite funny, actually, because um, my family um, give me a lot of abuse. They think I've got a really English accent. Um, <laughs> but actually, when I was grabbing my tea this morning, they said to me, they were like, oh, you're from Ireland. That's so cool. Your accent's so strong. And I was like, that's so funny, because every time I come home, my dad's like, oh, the queen. They <laughs> 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 sound so English, which is um, hilarious. So I'll let you guys decide. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I'm from Dublin originally. Um, have you guys been? Have you ever been? Yeah, yeah, yes. I've been a yeah. few times. Yeah, great place. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, no, I absolutely love it. It's such a, it's an amazing place to grow up because basically when you're from Dublin, all your friends stay in one place. But even when you go to university, like everyone is still in Dublin because it's like kind of like, you know, the capital city, everything else. So you just grow up with the same kind of group of friends throughout your life. Um, and you know, Dublin's such an amazing place because you've got like 20 minutes here in the mountains, 20 minutes here by the sea, 20 minutes here in the city centre. Like it's so diverse. 
Mm. And it's quite funny, my friends come over here to visit me, you know, I'm like, oh, it's just like, you know, we just get a bus and then a tube and then a train and then an overground and then, you know, it'll only be like an hour to get there. And they're like, ah, we'll be halfway across Ireland in an hour. Like, <laughs> um, so it's like, you know, it kind of changes a little bit. But yeah, no, um, Dublin born and bred for a long time anyway. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Well, uh, you, early on, you did say the word glove, and I was like, what is a glove? And then I realized, oh, you mean <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if that, if that makes, makes any difference. So tell us a little yeah. bit about your family situation, um, brothers and yeah. sisters, and, and what did mom and dad do? Yeah, so my situation, um, great way of putting it. Um, so uh, yeah, I have two parents and a brother. Um, I call him my... Uh, little big brother because he's older than me but I basically spend most of my time telling him um, what to do um, <laughs> and actually quite funnily enough my family are actually really short and I'm really tall and um, it's always been a bit of a joke <laughs> I like the same size feet as my dad which is a bit of a joke <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah my mom and dad um, they both actually work in two of the largest universities in Dublin so one works in University College Dublin and one works in Trinity College, um, Dublin. Um, so naturally, I went to Nida University, um, <laughs> much to their disappointment. <laughs> um, but yeah, so quite a, there's a lot of teachers in our family, quite a you know, teaching based family. Actually, my brother is quite interesting enough. Um, he actually moved to Korea to learn teaching as a photographer for years in Dublin, and mm. um, moved to Korea. Um, to learn teaching and now lives in Spain and um, with his wife and they're both teachers um, which is pretty awesome they're really inspiring actually to kind of yeah they really inspire me because they you know they were both photographers drafting away in Ireland and they just thought this this isn't really working out and you know we want a different lifestyle they didn't like the rain which you know you can't live in Ireland if you don't like the rain That's, yeah it's, it's pretty much a given but um and so they were like, right, and two of them dyslexic in school, like, you know, learned English, um, you know, the foreign language, um, TEFL course in school, and then moved to Korea. And like, now we're living in Spain and just loving life and ring me from their balcony, you know, being like, oh, it's 25 degrees. <laughs> glorious. Um, so, yeah, that's my family situation. Uh, that's that's awesome and and I mean growing up in Ireland beautiful beautiful country yeah. um, but I guess also it's had like it's sort of tainted past was mm. did you grow up in in any of that sort of era how old do you think I am um, <laughs> I'd say 25 <laughs> 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 Good one. We practiced uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I came a bit closer to the there. Um, yeah so it's quite interesting so my mom um, is from um, Donegal, which is in the north of Ireland, but not in Northern Ireland. Um, but, oh my God, if you haven't been, it's the most beautiful place. I always say that's where my soul is. It's just the most magnificent place on earth. It's so beautiful. It's so kind of barren, actually. You go there on a fine holiday weekend, you go to one of the beaches, and there'll be like three people on it. You know, it's beautiful. But when we were younger, we used to travel up there, um, and so we'd have to go through the border um into kind of northern ireland um and so you know there's many times we got stopped once um by armed guards um once our dog got taken off us and um, for a while i remember you know when i was quite young and i was really 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 scared about that um but the funny thing was that we used to go up for the summer so we would pack our car so tight and there'd be so many of us in the back there'd be like cousins everyone else and so, you know, they search you as you go through the borders. Um, and they used to like open the boot and they'd be like, oh, <laughs> I don't even want to start with this. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you go straight through. But that was kind of my only experience of that kind of real struggle was actually physically going through the borders. Um, but, um, you know, my auntie, quite interestingly, actually, she, um, she lost... Uh, Luckily enough, now none of our family were actually involved in, in many of the bombings or, you know, no one was hurt at any stage. But um, she didn't, um, she did lose all her wedding photographs. They all got blown up um, in the Oma bombing. So she has no uh, record of her, uh, of her marriage um, and uh, never got any of those things. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a interesting time. Not, you know, I was hugely exposed to, but, you know, now 
when they talk about bringing the borders back and everything else, and you wonder, you know, after making so much progress, um, it's it's a little bit sad to think that that has come back again. Mm. That's really, yeah, a really tough thing to try and imagine that, isn't it? Especially yeah. if you've lived it. And yeah. you, you spoke about how beautiful it is up there and then you decided to move to London. So what yeah. sort of prompted the move? For my sins. Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, well, actually, um, so I, when I started out in Dublin, so I did my undergrad in Dublin um, in sports science and health. Um, and that was quite funny because, as I said, you know, my mom taught in one university and my dad was in the other, and I didn't go to either. Um, but I went to this university that was across the other side of Dublin. I remember one of my friends crying when she found out I got into that university and being like, oh, you're going to be so far away and you're going to make all these new friends and everything else. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of the point. <laughs> like, um, even though it was in Dublin. But, uh, no, absolutely loved it. was totally obsessed, actually, even taking a step back from that. It was when my career teacher in school said to me, you know, um, oh, there's this degree, it's called like sports science, you know, um, you know, that could be something that you're interested in or, you know, something that a uh, few people are interested in at the moment. And I was like, that can't be a degree, it sounds way too fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I started out there actually. Um, and it was amazing. I did meet a whole new group of people and made um, amazing friends. Um, but it was quite interesting because I'd always been kind of into health and habits and all of that stuff. But then when you're around other people that have been like that as well, you're just like, yes, yeah, okay, you people get me. Like, you know, we're a total like health nuts all together. And um, I even remember like the first day, like, you know, people, had, everyone had brought in their past and we were all like comparing what people had brought. And um, yeah, it was really nice um, to find that tribe. Um, and then... From there, then I went. I was actually meant to do a master's or a PhD in, in Ireland um, in an amazing topic. Um, it was um, how optimism and pessimism is, re is related to cardiovascular disease um, oh. and examining, you know, um, long term disease outcomes based on um, people's um, positivity. But actually, um, that fell through. And luckily, I'd applied for a master's in tobacco. And it was a bit of a whirlwind because my granddad had died the same week as I found out that their PhD wasn't funded anymore and then I flew off to Loughborough University in Leicester um, to do a master's in physical activity and health. Um, now I I don't know when I applied for this master's or what I did as a backup but when I got there I didn't even know how to pronounce the word Loughborough. I thought it was Luga Baruga. <laughs> <laughs> I just got off this plane um, same way, like I was three days late because of my um, um, my granddad's funeral and had nowhere to stay like had never even like didn't even know where the town was from the airport everything just so last minute um but again got so lucky you know just had the nicest people around you know i don't know if you've heard of the free university but it's you know it's like one of the best universities for like sports science and health and everything so it brings a lot of people again that like have that kind of mindset and it was just an amazing place to learn and grow and actually quite interesting enough when i was there i did my thesis on um, sedentary behavior um and uh like the benefits of standing on your uh, on your mental health and I kind of, I think you guys are standing. Are you currently standing? Yeah, we're doing like star Which jumps now. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> um, yeah, so um, that was awesome. I got to work with Stuart Biddle, who's kind of one of the, um, kind of leaders in the field on uh, the wor world of sedentary behavior. And so we looked at what were those psychological correlates um, of, you know, too much sitting time or too much sedentary time um, and what impact that had on your health. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and then from, that was then, so I lived in Leicester for a while. Um, and then after that, then I went on, I got a PhD scholarship to the University of Birmingham. Um, so I lived in Birmingham then for four years before I um, then came to London. So I've been in actually the UK for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I suppose I'm lucky. I, I live so close to home that I can just pop and go back. Um, it's, it's not like for you guys, you know, it's a long way home, but um, <laughs> I'm very lucky I can pop back home. And, yeah. 
Yeah, that's cool. I can actually hear that that British accent that you're speaking a little bit about now. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> totally not. No, very, very Irish. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to party it up a notch or two. Just to... <laughs> uh, classic. Um, so actually, we, we were chatting a little bit about this um, before the podcast and over email. Um, we do a lot of research uh, on each of our guests. And, mm. um, you know, like I guess for you, you've got a lot of uh, information online about your business and what you do and your articles and things like that. Mm. Um, but I guess actually finding a bit more about you personally is, is a little bit harder. And you've made a conscious decision to be a little less present or have a low presence online. And I think it's a very interesting topic because I think we're going through this real uh, phase now where people are worried about the information that people can find on them, about fake profiles, about, you know, just so many things when it comes to what you actually do put out online. So Mm. what's your kind of reasoning behind all of that? Um, Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I love the way you put it, actually, Um, you know, that some people have concerns and I think it was just a very natural thing for me. I was never really that into social media. Um, I felt like it was just another thing to do on my to-do list. Um, And interacting with it actually kind of brought up, you know, negative feelings for me, comparisonitis, all of that kind of thing. And actually, um, over time, I realized, you know, this just isn't something that I like to engage with right now. You know, who can say in future, maybe I will like to engage in it. And I, I will like respect it for the platform that it gives you know like Instagram in a way is changing the culture in terms of health because there is such a health movement you know and it's in people's hands it's putting health in people's hands um but for me personally um I suppose like initially as well it, it might have been a little bit out of like and when I started my business even like I didn't want it to be about me I wanted it to be about the people um that I worked with um and obviously over time that evolves and you recognize that you know you have to be part of your brand and everything else but uh, and for me i found that um social media and having a big online presence was just distracting um from actually doing the the work that um, was important to me and i call it old school or naive or whatever else but um i like to do my business on word of mouth and i feel like you know a recommendation from someone else is the best um, kind of way, especially with my coaching work, because it is so one to one, it is so personal, so based on trust. Um, that um, for me, you know, just actually doing my business one to one is is kind of what works for me. I'm just a huge people person. I just love, you know, that face to face. And I found um, that social media, I just it was inauthentic for me as who I am, um, and it just wasn't something that right now isn't really aligned with who I am and what I do but for others you know I you see other people are absolutely smashing it and it's a great way to um spread the message um but I think it's really individual you know it's like does it bring you joy or you know does it um give you feel like you know that's another thing I have to do and I've got a lot of friends in the wellness industry that say to me you know you're so lucky you're actually really lucky that you're not into this because they're like you have that sense of obligation that you've mm. got to post, you've got everything else. And they're like, it's, it's nice to actually be able to kind of step back from that. So I really appreciate that actually. Mm. Wow. That, that makes so much sense. Uh, there's, there's an aspect of uh, the third dimension of the obligation of it. And I think mm. that, that is quite a big thing because, you know, w- once you feel that obligation you and you start fulfilling that obligation, it's very hard, I would imagine, to, then go to step back away from it, you know, because, yeah. uh, you know, you've engaged already. So, you know, you mentioned uh, referrals, word of mouth referral. I guess there's, there's no greater compliment, actually, um, as you mentioned. And, uh, and it's obviously always a, a testament to the kind of work you're doing. But you've actually studied behavior change and uh, weight maintenance psychology for, for 10 years. And you spoke a little bit about your path that you took to mm-hmm. get there. But... What is the specific path that took you to that specifically? Um, great question. Thank you. Um, and thanks for understanding that in terms of obligation. Um, uh, what took me to that? It's quite funny, actually. When I was working in sports science, I did a, a they call it an intra placement, so like a work placement in this hospital. And uh, I was working with personal trainers and nutritionists. 
and we had um, people in the hospital that were at, um, that had metabolic syndrome. So they had high marked cardiovascular risk, or they were overweight or obese, or they had diabetes. And we had these amazing exercise programs, and we had these amazing like diet plans and everything. And you know, some people were doing really, really well, but they were only a really small handful of people. And it just frustrated the hell out of me. I was like, I don't understand. Like, we've given people all of the tools that they need to be successful, and yet, you know, they they don't seem to be able to implement them. And so what I did, um, kind of actually behind the manager's back, was I booked people in for one-to-one slots because I just, like, again, I'm Irish and very nosy. Um, but I wanted to know why, you know? I wanted to know why these people couldn't make it stick and, like, what was going on for them. And that kind of got me really into understanding, you know, that behavior change, it's not a one size fits all. Like you can't just give people a plan and exercise and everything else. Like each person had their own story. Each person had their own individual set of barriers. Each person had their own experience and history of exercise. Um, and I sat down with every single person in the clinic and, you know, wanted to find out their story and why it was so hard for them. And that really got me hooked on it then. I wanted to know, you know, why some people were able to engage in health behaviors when so many other people fail and what were the characteristics that were unique to those people and what were the barriers that were getting in everyone else's way. And so that was actually what a lot of my first research was on. It was on um, you know, people that were successful at maintenance versus people that were unsuccessful and trying to look at what were those factors that differentiated um, those two sets of people. Um, and yeah, I was hooked from then on. Hmm. Wow. Super interesting. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so you obviously, you know, you, you've spent many years researching and uh, like in 2013, you completed your PhD. Like, can mm. you maybe like talk about a bit about the research? Like yeah. what sort of stuff were you researching? And then also maybe touch on what it's like and what it takes to complete a PhD because it's definitely no mean feat to get that under your belt. Yeah, well, thanks, Gareth. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so the research, well, one of my studies was that. So it was comparing um, successful maintenance um, with unsuccessful maintenance and looking at why people fail and when they fail. Um, and what was quite interesting about that was actually people that had adopted health as a lifestyle. Those were the people that, you know, they didn't, they didn't just do it as a kind of, you know, a six-week thing or just because it was January or anything else. It was those people that were adopting it as a healthy lifestyle. But the interesting thing that was quite different was the way that they responded to temptation. So, you know, when they, you know, ate a healthy diet all week and then they had something that was unhealthy, they thought, oh, well, you know, it's just one small blip um, and, you know, I'll get back on the horse. Whereas... The other people, you know, they ate a really healthy diet, perhaps were too restrictive, were too punishing. And the second they had, you know, like a Snickers on a Thursday, they were like, it's all ruined. Might as well have pizza for the weekend and then I'll start on Monday. So I, what I, then I became really interested in is, okay, well, when do people give in to temptation and why do they give in to temptation? And um, so we designed this app to examine exactly that. So it was called an ecological momentary assessment. So we got people to put in at the time, you know, when they were tempted, did they give in or not? Um, And we examined like all the factors that might have led up to actually people giving in to temptation. And that was really interesting because, you know, people were most tempted actually in certain times of day. And so it tended to be around half three o'clock in the afternoon, people were most tempted or half eight at night. And um, people tended to be more tempted by alcohol temptations um, than dietary temptations. They're more likely to give into that type of temptation. And then people gave into temptation um, for a range of reasons, you know, being around others that were giving into temptation, and um, that the temptation had kind of cropped up in the environment. Um, but also what was really interesting was how people coped with that temptation. And there's people that coped really well with the temptation in a way that they saw it as, you know, a minor thing and were able to move on, tended to be the people that fared best. Um, and so we were just really, really interested in, you know, what it is that like drove these people to be able to have that different response um, to temptation. And basically, um, after that, then we designed an intervention, which was really quite interesting. We looked at um, a typical diet and exercise program, and we looked at a psychological skills program. And in the diet and exercise program, they weren't allowed to do any psychological skills. And in the psychological skills program, they weren't allowed to do any diet or exercise. 
So they worked on their coping responses, their mindfulness, um, you know, their goals, their values, um, all of these different, how to overcome barriers. And then the diet and exercise program, you know, they just did a typical kind of diet and exercise program. And this was in quite a low income group. And what we found was, um, you know, the weight loss and the results and everything were the same for the two groups. Even though, you know, these guys weren't allowed to do any um, particular changes to their diet or exercise. Um, but these guys, you know, they had higher self-esteem, they had higher motivation, they had lower levels of depression after the intervention. And it was quite interesting because it just showed that that power of actually developing those psychological skills was so important. And I kind of always put it this way, like, you know, a lot of us know what we need to do to be healthy. We know that we need to eat vegetables. We know that we need to exercise every day. And I call those the ingredients of, you know, healthy habits. And then I see behavior change as the method, because whilst we know that those ingredients are important, we know we need to exercise, we know we need to eat vegetables, what's most difficult for people is actually then making it stick. And so that's where behavior change psychology comes in. It kind of gives you the skills, the knowledge, the tools, the confidence to be able to then engage with your healthy habits in a way that's actually you know, most long lasting. And so, you know, what my big passion is, is maintenance. It's this maintenance piece of behavior. It's actually, how do we equip people with those those skills um, and the confidence to execute those skills, you know, um, long term. Mm. Um, so that was kind of what the research was about, really, um, in a bit of a nutshell. Um, and then the PhD experience was an interesting one. Um, it's, uh, I always, when people say to me, oh, I'm thinking about doing a PhD, I ask them, okay, well, two things. One, like, is this something that you would look at late at night on your phone? Would you look up articles? Like, are you really intrinsically motivated towards that? Is that something that you're obsessed with? Okay. And two, are you ready to be really, really poor? Um, <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, those are the kind of two things I think, you know, like the reason that, you know, I was able to do my PhD, I was so lucky because it was in an area that absolutely fascinated me and I was so driven to find out the answers and I was just so lucky I had such an interesting topic and really, really blessed and I, you know, um, but it was, it was, it's hard going, like you get, you don't get a lot of money, um, you know, you're not a great person to be around, you know, your head is in, is, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, my husband's very resilient um, person, um, but we actually, yeah, we lived away from each other for four years as well, um, and yeah, I actually, <laughs> the distinctive thing that I remember from my PhD is um, really large bags of porridge and bags of sweet potatoes, because <laughs> I had about 12 pounds a week to spend on food, so <laughs> I used to have to work out, you know, ways of being healthy with you know 10 pounds 12 pounds a week um, and so i used to like bulk buy like massive things of porridge and massive things <laughs> and baked beans and um i actually haven't been able to have a sweet potato and baked beans but um oh, it's a fantastic experience like i'll never take it back you know it absolutely wonderful experience i feel so lucky to been able to do it and um yeah it was a fun time yeah i, I would have with your research it would have been interesting to hear if you had, had a third uh, sort of uh focus group of combining the two obviously you know what i mean yeah. and, and then seeing what have had would have happened over there but um you know your research uh, has been published globally in journals and other publications around the world and um, sort of two questions on what does it take to get something published and also what is the motivator behind getting something what is the reward is it financial is it uh, like a kudos or what, what is the sort of driving force behind it all um, I love that what a great question I'd love to ask uh, people in academia that <laughs> <laughs> uh, like what does it take to get published I think um, Having a really good editor that's been through it themselves, someone that can edit your stuff really well, and my supervisor was meticulous with an even word. He was, yeah, like every um, full stop, every sentence. And I actually, like, I'm so lucky that I had that because he really pushed me to kind of, and he had, wi had widely published himself, you know, a very, very successful researcher. 
and he pushed me, you know, to really um, take it up a notch. You know, when you, you've done something and you're like, there is no more doing this. This is hard to say. He'd be like, no, we can go and more. We can go and more. <laughs> um, so he was amazing. And then having really good reviewers, I was really lucky that, um, you know, some of my stuff, because it was such a topic of interest at the time, was picked up by quite big journals. And um, the reviewers would provide you with really interesting kind of feedback. Um, on that um so that really helped as well um but i think with your later question actually kind of yeah it kind of it hit the nerve i suppose in a way um because actually that was one of the reasons why i left academia um because i wasn't interested in the publishing of studies i was interested in disseminating the words um of what we kind of found but actually um i found that you're only really disseminating to other researchers, which is great because it obviously forwards the field and everything else. But I really wanted to talk to people face to face about, you know, what was happening and, and having spent so long looking at what works for weight maintenance, for habit maintenance and everything else. Yet all I was seeing with my friends, in the media, everything else was like so many people were on these weight loss transformations and so the lights just went out. I'm not moving enough in here. And <laughs> um, oh. um, no, yeah, yeah. I just got really frustrated. Even like my friends, you know, were trying out these like different kind of diets and stuff. And I was like, how is this stuff that we know is effective for long-term habit maintenance? Why isn't that translated into day-to-day -day life? And you know, I felt like if I stayed in academia, it potentially wasn't going to give me that opportunity to translate in that same way. Um, and so, um, yeah, after my PhD, I, I left, which was, was quite interesting after, you know, having my, my mom's an academic, has been in academia all her life, you know, and it was a bit of a, a strange um, corner to turn, but I really wanted to be in the trenches, kind of creating interventions and working with people. Um, and that's when I started working um, for the charities and then doing kind of more of my consultancy work where I designed interventions and worked kind of one-to-one -one with people. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love that question quite because actually that didn't interest me. Um, and, I, and I knew that like that's like an important driver, not the only driver, but in academia, you, know, you have to want to publish. Um, and, you know, um, I, I kind of wanted to look down a different route for dissemination. Um, and so it wasn't really the path for me. And just a, a bit of a side question here, like, what like from a sort of a psychological point of view once you put out this paper and you think this is the bomb and then you get feedback and like it's either yeah. your grammar that is like completely like incorrect or oh, or, or, or something else like how yeah. did that make you feel did you is it like does your ego get in the way when you receive that sort of feedback and you're like oh no that maybe you're not right or what what is how did that work for you you know what it was kind of actually the opposite i was just like oh these people want to feed back on this this is they're interested like i don't know what it was but i just i didn't even think people would be interested in it i just expected to be rejected straight away and like especially with the annals of behavioral medicine you know such a huge psychology journal that i thought oh it's just going to be nah you know like oh, it's going to be rejected so actually getting the feedback was really cool but the, the thing that's really hard is actually deciding what feedback you want to take on board and what you want to let go of because, um, you know, you've got to stay true to the study itself and you can't, you know, change every aspect of it. And you've got to, I suppose you've got to stay true to the integrity of the study and what you set out to do. And sometimes people will ask you to extra analyses that kind of, you know, compromises that or, you know, they'll have a particular research area that they're interested in. So they're kind of, you know, projecting their ideas about where the paper should be. Um, and having been a reviewer, you know, I completely understand that as well. Um, but I was just, you know, yeah, I was just so happy that people were willing to comment on it. And um, yeah, I just felt really lucky to be able to be a part of that. So. Yeah, that's cool. That's a great way to think of it. And one of the, one of the things that you did, which I found really interesting is you ran a, uh, healthy lifestyle clinic for hospital staff is that right mm -hmm. yeah what, yeah so, so what is that like the hospital staff go and stay in a clinic or is this a clinic they go to how did that work um 
Right, where did you find that one? Um, yeah, that was uh, uh, that was actually um, it was in the hospital, um, and that was actually that was the thing that got me started was the running that clinic. That was where we had the great exercise plans and the diet plans and everything else, and um, that's when I started talking to people about their habit changes in the first place. And um, so that was yeah, that was back in the day um but that really got what got me started i think um but yeah that was kind of my drive as well it was that working with people and running those like in those kind of individual interventions or those group-based interventions that um that was where i wanted to be rather than kind of you know in the lab like other researchers and i have so much respect for people that can you know stay in the lab i just wanted to be out chatting to people and so i i don't think the research um, life was really for me because <laughs> I just wanted to meet people and I <laughs> didn't want to be in the office all the time so it was quite a quite a big step to turn my back on that. Oh, wow. wow I can imagine and so um, so they were it was that sort of a corporate wellness thing but specifically tailor-made to the staff there just to you just kind of keep them in you know monitor how they're doing in, as a general thing or was it also yeah. specifically weight maintenance yeah actually do you know what people so i just took over and i uh <laughs> it was originally you know to monitor markers of metabolic syndrome which we still did um but i wanted people to set their own goals whatever was most important to them and sometimes you know it wasn't their diabetes that was most important or preventing cardiovascular disease it was you know that they wanted to be able to run for the bus and not get out of breath or it was that they you know wanted to be able to climb the stairs to their office or whatever else so actually um i brought it back to people and asked them well what do you want to get out of this like you know what's most important for you rather than you know what you know the powers that be in the hospital had told them should be their mm-hmm. outcome and um, so yeah just bring it back to the person and, and seeing what what was best for them and then i kind of tailored each person's program and um, based on that that's brilliant. And now you're a member of Mint and Gareth and I were kind of, we were having an, uh, like a chat about what we reckon it is uh, oh, exactly. Great. The motivational interviewing network of trainers. Can you yeah. explain what, what that is a little bit? Yeah. Please. Um, oh, that's, yeah. And we also always have fresh breath. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it is it's an awesome organization. It's, so motivation interviewing is basically a conversation about motivating people to change. Um, so it's a guided style um, or a kind of guiding style of um, counselling. Um, so it's the style that I use in my coaching practice. In, and I absolutely love it because it is all about respecting the person as the expert on themselves. Um, and so you trust that they've got the strength within to actually make the changes that they need to make. It's just about unpeeling those layers and kind of being there as a support system um, and asking the right questions in the right way and supporting them to kind of find those strengths. Um, and that re- it really echoes with my philosophy of um, behavior change, which is, you know, each person, they have the strengths that they need to change. They have everything. They just haven't woken up to it. And I've got a really cheesy um, analogy, which is I, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz um, and Dorothy. And, um, you know, you've got to kind of go on that journey and you've got to follow that yellow brick road sometimes, you know, um, and be supported and learn different lessons, you know, to understand that you've got the strength to go home, um, you know, the whole time. And the strength was always inside her. And I, I feel like that is the same with um, people in terms of behavior change. You know, you have all that you need to make the changes. Um, you've just got to unlock that within the person and I, I that's why I don't like to refer to myself ever as an expert because I feel like everyone I work with you know they're the experts on themselves and so uh, it's for me to guide them through their own expertise and provide supportive um, conversations for change and really that's what um, motivation interviewing is really all about it's kind of about you know treating that person as an expert and guiding them towards the changes that are best for them because I don't have the best ideas to help someone else change they have they're the ones with the best ideas the second someone starts telling you what to do you know that's when you start to pull back Mm. and you know and you're like well actually I didn't ask for your advice thank you very much and you know because it's a typical thing you know people come in and people will say to you oh you're overweight are you exercising enough 
you know, what are you eating? Um, okay, well, you actually have to do these things because this is really bad and you're in a bad situation. Do you think that person hasn't thought about that? Like they haven't thought about their health, they haven't thought about those things. Um, you know, so it's actually helping that person understand, you know, the best ways you can go about changing that rather than telling them what to do, which is not a nice way to have to work with people. Um, so motivation issuing is really kind of, that's, that's psychological method that I was gravitated towards because it really represents that, treating that person as an expert. For sure. Makes a lot of sense. There's really an art to, to coaching. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's not about giving advice in any sort of capacity. It's literally about uh, working out what the right questions are to ask so that person can mm-hmm. almost answer the question for themselves and, and go yeah. realize, okay, that's maybe what I should be doing. And yeah. when they say it, it kind of just goes a bit deeper inside them and they're like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a lovely phrase in motivation to in the book that says like, you know, it's almost like having a conversation with yourself and until you hear what you say kind of out loud, mm-hmm. it's only then that you click and you say, oh, actually, yeah, no, that makes sense to me now. And then I have to be, if I'm on the phone to clients, I have to kind of control my face because I get really excited when people have like, yeah, they got it. Moments. Yeah, I want to be like, oh, <laughs> I'm just like, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> But inside, I'm like, yeah. yeah. I know exactly how that makes you feel. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I have a lot of respect for society, and they're incredible, absolutely incredible. And I love working um, in a motivation and tune way. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome field of psychology. Yeah, that's great. And um, I guess, like, on your whole journey, you've obviously done a whole lot of research, you've been through a whole lot of uh, different things, and one of those things like you've touched on already is you had certain frustrations and out of those frustrations, uh, Dr. Heather McKee, the, your website and your business has mm. sort of been built and born. So yeah. w- w- were there any other sort of trajectories that sort of led you to go down uh, creating your own business? Um, yeah. Do you know what? I really did not want to have my own business. Like I remember like doing business, like a business module when we were in uh, sports science and being like, oh, it's so much work. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> deal with this. It's so hard. Um, and actually, it's quite funny because so I went in and I was kind of working, you know, I was working for charities. Um, and then my paper, one of my papers got picked up by the press in the U.S. And, you know, I was getting different phone calls and different um, media approach me and journalists. And I was on the phone to a journalist from the Washington Post. And they said to me, oh, your work is really interesting. You know, what, what's your website? Um, and I was like, I just made up a website. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got off the phone with them. And I, um, I texted my brother-in-law and was like, I need a website <laughs> and after telling these guys that I've got a website and I don't. Um, but it was actually, you know, it was the media picking up all that stuff that made me realize that actually people are interested in this. And I got a lot of people um, starting to contact me individually and saying like, you know, I, I thought that dieting was the only way. I thought punishment was the only way. I didn't know that there was another way that, you know, you could, you know, be healthy and maintain your habits long term and I've struggled and I'm frustrated and you know I don't want to feel like I'm restricting myself anymore I just want to live a balanced life and I just want to be able to do these things and stop thinking about it so much and I was like wow people are interested in this because I thought you know there's nothing more unsexy than maintenance you know where versus like transformation you know we see all these things in the media that's like wow you yeah know, bikini body everything else where I'm like all changes consistently have patience then you'll maintain you know so I just thought people wouldn't be interested in general and but you know that taught me that people were and so based off the back of that then I set up a website and um yeah started seeing some um coaching clients um as well as kind of doing like consultancy work at the same time so that's really what kick-started so it's a very reluctant entrepreneur um in a way and for a long time i would be i was like no i don't have a business i just kind of chat to people on the phone for money yeah and i i 
I, yeah, I feel so lucky because I absolutely loved it. And then now I'm a total business nerd. I love learning about businesses. I love, you know, I love business podcasts. I'm obsessed with productivity stuff. I love understanding how other people run their businesses. Now working with, you know, I work with various different businesses with my consultancy, some startups, some charities, you know, some bigger corporations. But a lot of them are, you know, like early stage, startups and I just love understanding like that heartbeat of a business you know the passion that drove people to actually engage with that in the first place and now that I'm in business there's so many parallels between habit change and actual um you know business itself you know like having that self-discipline you know having those routines the importance of having systems and you know I catch myself so often being like oh the reason I wasn't able to cope in that situation is because I didn't have a plan and I'm like that's what I preach in health and then I was like how interesting like there's so many parallels um so I think my background in habit change and behavioral maintenance actually was really helpful in terms of actually then in, in business you know and um, building that resilience you know having that patience all of those different factors I'm sure that you guys know all too well um, about having to run your own business yeah no that makes a lot of sense is that yeah, accretion as one of our previous guests had uh, used that term and it's all the small things that build up to yeah. create um, the, the, the bigger picture. So, you oh. know, just moving forward a little bit off the back of your business and what you do into a bit more of like the actual science a little bit and the nitty gritty of, of human behavior and habits and that kind of thing. Why do you people gravitate toward sort of fad diets and quick fixes? Um, I suppose because, you know, it's the dream. It's the dream to be able to make these kind of changes overnight with no effort. Like, you know, imagine sitting on your couch with a pair of slender tone pants on that give you, you know, the form that you've always wanted by while you watch Netflix. Like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, people are selling the dream, you know, and, uh, and they're playing into people's vulnerabilities as well. And, um, you know, promising transformation. It's ethically really un unresponsible. And, um, but, you know, it plays to our vulnerabilities. We all want to feel like we can, you know, transform overnight. And our society, unfortunately, places a lot of emphasis on what your body looks like. And, you know, a lot of emphasis that success is related to how your body looks. Um, and so people are lured in by these fads and quick fixes um, because they, you know, it's, it's quite interesting actually because most of my clients you know initially come to me because they're like yeah I want to kind of get away from that weight loss mindset and uh, you know get into the weight maintenance mindset but we actually never talk about weight loss and I was actually um well like with with some of them anyway um and even in some of my studies I was uh, reluctant to actually weigh people because what we know in the research is a focus on weight loss leads to that short-term mindset, you know, mm. whereas if you focus on actually improving your health and you take a health focus rather than an appearance focus, you're much more likely to actually maintain those habits. And as a consequence, you know, a side effect is weight loss. Um, but it's health gain is what you're looking for ultimately. But as soon as you kind of come with that weight loss mindset, you know, that's when you're going to fail. That's when you're going to see things as, oh, I'm going to do this really hard for six weeks. Um, you know, and have that transformation. But actually, you know, what's happening in six months? That's what I, I, you know, I ask people, is this something you're going to be sustaining in six years' time? Because if it's not, you know, why would you engage with it now? Yeah, um, it's it just, yeah. I still have mates that weigh themselves every day. Mm. And I think to myself, I can't be healthy, like, you know? Yeah, well, it's interesting, actually, the weighing thing, because for some people, it works really well. Um, so for some people, they have the ability to kind of not hold their self-esteem in the scale. And they can just look at it objectively if they're quite a numbers person and they can see, okay, you know, I had a burrito last night, I weigh more today, you know, or whatever it is. Um, but for a lot of people, I, I say to them, like, is it positively motivating for you? Like, if you've had a really healthy week and, you know, you're really proud of all the choices that you've made and you're feeling great in yourself and you stand on the scales and it doesn't tell you what you wanted to say, you know, that leads to shame, it leads to guilt, mm. it often leads to binge eating, it often leads to that kind of negative self-talk. And, you know, that's not positively motivating. So if that isn't going to help you engage with your health, then, you know, it's not for you. 
And, and this is the thing about um, habit change, is that so many people kind of hang on to certain beliefs. Um, and actually, you know, if it's not working for you, let it go. Try something else, you know. And like, again, like the parallels team business, experiment, fail fast, you know, learn from your failures. And that was like the final, the final study that we had um, as part of my PhD research, you know, the underlying theme. And I put it at the top of the, um, the paper was failure is success if you learn from it. Those people that were most successful at lifestyle change, you know, that you know, previously really struggled with their weight, really struggled with their health, and then, you know, were able to manage it for years on end um, in a really positive way was because they learned from their successes. You know, they didn't use failure as a mother stick to beat themselves with. They went back and they examined, okay, what went wrong? What went wrong in this situation? Was I depriving myself too much? You know, was I being too hard on myself? You know, was I trying to find this transformation? Were these goals actually things that I absolutely enjoy? And like that's one of my biggest passions um, is f helping people find that joy in their health related behaviors because as soon as you find things that you enjoy that's when they're going to stick that's the most sticky factor that you've got in terms of behavior change is like finding those joyful characteristics and actually one thing i get my clients to do is i get them to write like a, a joy list so like any of those like healthy habits that they enjoy and even something as like minor as like the crunch of an apple or, you know, like having a glass of water and with lemon or, you know, going out and the crunch of the leaves, like now here in London, you know, like one of my favorite things to do is like find the crunchy leaves, um, you know, and, and so like those minor things, but that we overlook often because so many of us, you know, take this mindset when it comes to our health, it's got to be regime, it's got to be punishment, it's got to be tough if it isn't hard, you know, well, we're not trying hard enough, you know, that whole mm. no pain, no gain mantra. And actually, you know, what we know from the research is it's, it's the opposite. It's, you know, self-kindness, self-compassion. You know, like you mentioned, um, Craig, you know, there's like those small changes cumulatively. And those are the kind of key factors that, you know, make it stick for you. Because why would you do something that you don't enjoy? You know, why would you stick with something you don't enjoy? And so, you know, if I were to give people one kind of take home, um, you know, message. It would be, you know, try and find the joy in your health related behaviors. You know, try and find that, those things that you love to do, um, you know, that inherently are part of you, because um, that's what's going to help you um, stick with those habits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lots of value there, that's for sure. And well, one of the other things that you, you talk about too is about uh, willpower and yeah. like the, the myth. I guess of willpower, and then the, your yeah. sort of alternative offer is a skill power. So, <laughs> what is that? Um, yeah, what is that? Yeah, I I love that you brought that one up actually, because um, yeah, so many of us rely on our willpower when it comes to like our health, and you know, like willpower is like a muscle. So you know, like if you go to the gym every day and you train, you know, your right bicep by Friday, you're not going to be able to even lift it like you know your arm is going to be falling off um but if you go you know you maybe do biceps do legs you know and come back to biceps next week you know it grows stronger over time and you're able to build that muscle and willpower is just like that you know it needs active periods of recovery and rest you can't use it all up and um, very quickly or it runs out you know and you get what we call ego depletion um, and so you know you've got to kind of use your willpower in in, in shorter amounts but you know on the other on the other hand it's like dieting you know we try and use all of our willpower and so often when we you know we set goals let's think of new year's you know we try and make all of the changes you know we're gonna like you know quit smoking we're gonna exercise more we're gonna be a nicer person in the morning whatever it happens to be you know we're gonna save and um, we're gonna exercise every day we have this vision of you know we're gonna do all of the things but actually you know the more goals we add in the more we dilute our effect um, I don't know if you've read the book, again, The Parallel Team Business and Habit Change, Essentialism by Greg McCown. No, no. Oh, so he's got this really, I'll, I'll draw it for you. Um, he's got this really amazing um, picture that he does where he says, you know, if you've got one goal, then we can do that. And, you know, you're following it in one way. You make a huge trajectory and you have much more success on that one goal. But if you've got multiple goals, you know, you're only going to have so much willpower to go towards each of those goals um, and so you know you're much better off at focusing on one thing 
but doing it incrementally over time. And I always say to people, you know, it's better to go to the gym once a week for seven weeks than it is to go for seven days, you know, and then burn out because it's actually repetition that builds a habit over time. And so, yeah, when, when it comes to habit change, you know, actually one of the key factors that we find in both the research and it's been shown in research since is that people actually set up the environment to make that healthier choice, the easier choice for them. They didn't rely on their willpower. They relied on their own personal skills and their environment to support their healthy habits. Those are the people that were most successful. And so people that actually, you know, didn't have as many um, temptations in their environment and actually, you know, set things up in a way that it made it easier to actually, you know, go to the gym or eat healthier. Um, you know, those are the people that tended to be more successful. So I say actually even more so than skill power, it's almost like planning power. If you can plan your life or set your life up in a way that you're not relying on willpower, you're not going to have to rely on your ability to resist something. And um, there's an amazing um, weight loss researcher uh, called Dr. Yanni Friedhoff. And he has this amazing phrase, and I'm totally going to botch it, but it's <laughs> um, willpower is the absence of hunger. Mm. And I just think, yes, it is. And if we can be prepared enough, you know, in all situations, you know, we have so much more willpower, you know, when we've prepared our meals, when we've, you know, eaten something that's sustainable, that's nourishing, everything else. Um, and so often, though, it's that's the exact opposite of dieting. You know, it's all about restrict everything else. And that's why, you know, when it comes to it, the second someone goes off the diet, their hunger hormones are going crazy. Um, you know, and they, they will give in to temptation and they'll eat all of the things because evolution, you know, we, we have to preferentiate, you know, high calorie foods and we're starving. And essentially, that's what dieting is. And the funny thing is, you know, and I hope, I'm sure most people know this now, but the, the main thing that's correlated with weight gain long term is dieting. And that just seems, you know, so crazy when you think about it. But if you want to gain weight long term, you know, go on a diet because that's the surefire way to gain weight. Crazy. It yeah, doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I, I can kind of relate that. I, I used to do like a fair bit of uh, bodybuilding and, you know, guys would really, really suffer after they had competed. Guys and girls uh, would suffer after they had competed because mm. they'd be dieting so hard to get onto stage. And then the next day or that evening, they were like, right, I'm just going to eat whatever I can. And they would blow up. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. like, then they would put on all this weight that they'd really lost. So mm. validates exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah, and I can imagine that would be really tough as well. I, I, you see it in athletes as well that have to, you know, make weight for different events and stuff like that, you know, the impact it has on their metabolism. Um, and there was a really interesting study actually they did, um, you know, The Biggest Loser, mm. um, the TV show, and they showed that some of the people on the show, their metabolisms had slowed so significantly. I think one person, their metabolism had slowed to about 800 calories, their BMR, so the basal metabolic rate, so the rate that they burn calories at rest, was 800 calories hmm. a day. Um, you know, nor for a normal person, it's about 2,200. Um, and, you know, that's crazy, you know, yeah. but it's because they mess with their metabolism, you know, so much. And then they've got all those higher circulating hunger hormones and everything else as a result of um, being deprived for so long, you know. Um, yeah, it's not a sport I want to get into bodybuilding. It's very, very tough. Very, very tough. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my cousin is actually going to be really happy with you because he coincidentally just yesterday literally said, you need to read that book, Essentialism. So I'm like, all right, yeah. now I really am going to have to. So discussing yeah. um, habits. Well, now you know uh, it all. It's all in the picture now. Uh, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm all good now. <laughs> the, the science behind habits, there's obviously you hear lots of stories like, you know, um, in 21 days, your habits done and dusted, you sorted it and you hear things from people, but let's, if we could talk a little bit more about some of the science behind habits and, uh, yeah, maybe you can just like lead us into the habits of human beings more specifically. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I suppose I've got a question for you. How long do you guys think it takes to uh, break habits? or make a habit 
I mean, I only go on what people say, like, you know, the three week sort of thing. Um, and I guess if I related to myself, I'm probably like to actually start a habit, I would say is for me, maybe two to three weeks. I don't know about breaking one. I haven't kind of figured that one out yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite interesting because actually that 21 days thing is, is based on um, some research that was done in the 60s. Um, and it was done um, in relation to uh, plastic surgery um, research. And it was actually how long people um, took to adapt to um, either losing a limb or, you know, having facial reconstruction. And it, it was how long it took them to recognize themselves. Um, afterwards and for some reason what's been extrapolated from that is that it takes 21 days to then make a habit um, but actually more recently uh, the University College of London sorry um, UCL they've done research that's shown it takes something between 66 and 122 days hmm. um, and that depends on how complex the habit is and this is what goes back to um, what you said Craig about the small changes because the simpler actions become habitual quicker. Um, and so I always say to people, you know, um, you know, uh, like how many of us have, you know, made a New Year's resolution? How many of us have, you know, promised to start a new goal on Monday? How many of us have, you know, tried to take up a number of things at once? And then I say, how many of us forgot to brush our teeth in the morning? Um, and, you know, how many of us did? And well, I, I haven't forgotten. Like, you know, I do it every day. And that's because it's, it's a habit. Um, I'm going to stand up again because um, the lights have gone off to remind me how sedentary I'm being. So you'll see a, you'll see a crazy close-up of me. Um, uh, but yeah, but if we go to the science of it, you know, habits are built through context-dependent repetition. Um, so that means if you do something enough times in the same circumstance, it then becomes a habit. So, you know, you wake up, it's your cue to go into the bathroom and brush your teeth. And the reward is, you know, positive dental hygiene, fresh breath, whatever it happens to be. But it's not like you sat in bed and you weighed up the pros and cons of positive dental hygiene. You know, you're like, oh, what if I get away with those like three minutes instead of brushing my teeth? You know, I could just lie here in bed. You know, it's just a habit. So you just did it automatically. Um, and that's kind of what we try and, and, you know, one of the skills we try and build in people is, you know, like, let's start with the smallest step possible. Let's make it easy. I always say, like, you want to make your habits the ones that you trip over. You know, they're so simple. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look at that habit loop. So, um, you know, look at what the cue or trigger is. Look at what the action or behavior is. And then look at the reward. Um, and that's a really good way to kind of then approach habit change. Um, so, you know, if you want to, break a habit or make a habit like look at okay well what's going to cue or trigger you to engage with a habit in the first place um, and then ultimately it's about looking at what the reward you seek is um, and I suppose maybe it's easier actually talking about this um, and it might be interesting to you Gareth because you said you know it's still something that you're interested in and um, learning more about is that you know when it comes to breaking a habit um, you know I think of habits um, like a tangled knot um, like this kind of thing, which I always seem to have. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a complex mesh, you know, of all these different behaviors. Um, so take, you know, if you're trying to put down on sugar or give up sugar, you know, there's, it's, there's not just one thing. There's, you know, where you have sugar, why you have sugar, what drives you to have it, what circumstances it's in, what environment it's in. Um, and rather than trying to just give up sugar altogether, you know, which is just going to make that not tighter, more difficult. You know, you'd look for that kind of low-hanging fruit, first of all. So you'd look for, you know, what's the easiest win that you can make, you know, this week? And, um, you know, what's that easiest part of that kind of habit loop that you can untangle? Um, and, you know, you start with that. Um, and you do that consistently enough that you've got the confidence to then execute on another part of the habit loop. Um, and you think about the cues and the triggers and the rewards. So going back to some of the research that we looked at, you know, we wanted to know when people were most tempted and why. And so finding that out is really, really interesting. And um, one thing I always encourage people to do is to do like a temptation tracker or a hunger tracker and actually look at throughout their day, like when are you most tempted and why? Because we all think that we have all this really spontaneous behavior, but actually when you take a step back, 
you know, objectively, you, you've got these patterns. We all have patterns in our behaviors. And we give in to certain temptations. It tends to be at the same time of day. It tends to be the same temptation. And so I always encourage people, become really curious about that. You know, start tracking when you give in to temptation. Start tracking, you know, why you think it is. Is it boredom? Is it, you know, loneliness? Is it like um, stress? You know, so often um, people kind of, their go-to um, is, you know, to eat rather than actually to cope with the feeling that they're having at the time. And actually what I do with a lot of my clients is we look at this. We look at, okay, well, what, like, you know, are you trying to deal with stress? Is it that you just actually needed a break? You know, is it that you actually just need more sleep? Um, there's, there's one client, for example, I suppose, let's put this into kind of a tangible example. So um, I had a client that drank an awful lot of coffee. Um, and again, if you'd taken that ingredient of bled approach, it would have been to get him onto decaf coffee, onto green tea, everything else. But if we take a behavior change approach, I wanted to know when he was drinking the coffee, why he was drinking the coffee, what his sleep cycles were like, what his stress was like, what were his underlying beliefs about coffee, what did coffee help him do? Um, you know, and he believed that it gave him energy, he believed that it made him more focused on his work. Um, you know, he had all these various different beliefs. But once we started to look at actually helping him manage his stress, helping him manage his sleep better, once he started to get more sleep, he didn't need as much coffee. And actually, you know, in time, he realized that coffee was just a crutch and he was just covering up for um, another behavior that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't engaging in his own self-care. He wasn't listening to his body. He wasn't listening to the fact that he was actually tired and he needed more sleep. He was just trying to push through, push through, push through. And actually, it made him more effective at his job, ultimately, to get more sleep and drink less coffee. But it was originally a belief he had, and that belief over time changed because we looked at, you know, what was that reward he was seeking from drinking that coffee? It's so interesting. Like, when you talk about that, it's, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just, I guess, maybe the way I'm wired, but it's almost like that's so obvious, you know, that's, that, that's why people do, you know, yeah. for example, this guy was drinking so much coffee. But, um, but often I guess it's, you know, that's why we need people like yourself as coaches to kind of help people realize that, that, okay, this is the reason why you're doing it. And yeah. I'd, I'd just like to, to find out, is there a reason why you might have a habit like related to say your formative years? So, you know, they say the formative years, I guess, are from zero to six. Is there some science around that, around that like why you might be doing something when you're an adult because of what's happened to you when you were a youngster? Um, yeah, there is. It's, it's a little bit um, heterogeneous. So they, like, you know, there's stuff for and, and against, and some people do take on those habits and they last throughout their lives. And for others, you know, they're managed to kind of let them go. But when it comes to obesity research, that's really quite interesting because there's this window now that they found, um, most recently they've done this study on 50,000 children. And they found that if, you know, um, if you're obese as a three-year-old, you're 90% more likely to be obese as an adolescent. But if you can prevent obesity between the ages of three and six, it's, you know, you've, you've got a much better chance of actually preventing that person becoming obese in later life. And those kind of things are really key. And, and so actually, you know, that's one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is a childhood uh, obesity project and that's the exact window that we're looking at because we're looking at how do we establish healthy habits in that age because um, it's even more so it's about the relationship that children have with their food at that time and, and I think actually Gareth going back to your question you know it's like how do we form a healthy and a happy relationship with food um, and what we're doing in this study is rather than kind of you know shaming children into you know eat vegetables you know good for you kind of thing we're trying to make vegetables fun because um i was reading a study yesterday you know children in a typical week of tv they get 500 food references a week mm. when would they watch tv and those food references are high fat high sugar high calorie really high processed foods and they're primed to engage you know in those unhealthy foods and those unhealthy foods are made really exciting and so what we're trying to do is we're designing this game that actually makes vegetables and fruit fun. We're trying to intrigue children to actually become agents for change 
um, in their own habit change and not just rely on the parents, although they are primary and they're very important for the teachers, but actually getting children excited about vegetables, trying to prime them so they actually have more incidences where they see vegetables, so they have more vegetables in their life. Because if you think about it, if we started to advertise a banana, like the amount of amazing benefits, you know, that they're in a banana. But again, there's no marketing company behind it. So it's not being sold with all the bells and the whistles. Um, and yet, we know that you eat what you see. You eat what you're, you know, you, you're primed to eat. And like, unfortunately, they've shown now in cities that children as young as three, um, you know, can recognize McDonald's branding, but they can't name more than two vegetables, hmm. you know? Hmm. And it's, it's that, like, that's really scary. Like, that scares me a lot. And so actually working, yeah, in these formative years, actually having interventions at that time can be really, really helpful. And also giving parents, you know, help, helping them understand, like, you know, that their, um, their behaviors impact children and that their relationship with food impacts how their children um, interact with food. Um, and so helping them actually grow those skills um, you know, we all know it's easy, or it's not easy, we all know it's important to eat vegetables, but often we don't know how to prepare them, we don't know where to get um, healthy food, we don't know, you know, the best ways of going about doing that, so actually building their skills, and having the children, you know, become curious about it, and them asking their parents, you know, what is an aubergine, or what is a courgette, or what's this crazy white radish, you know, getting them really intrigued and excited about vegetables, I think is really, really important, because, we're, we're battling against the media with all these beautiful, crazy, brightly packaged, coloured, um, processed foods. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to um, kind of turn the tide against that and help, you know, yeah, children create those sustainable, healthy habits that are based around joy and fun and wanting to take care of themselves. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a beautiful question. Yeah. I, I think it's um, like we both feel very passionately about this and it's, you know, we feel strongly about this. It's a real complex thing, like you say, because my knee-jerk reaction is to say, look at these parents, look at them. They, that kid's overweight because of the parent. And, mm. and I mean, but you're also saying that the kids have some role themselves, which is interesting, but obviously the parents ultimately are the gatekeepers. Um, mm. So it is, it is quite a real interesting sort of thing that, um, and it's, but one shouldn't be too quick to just blame one thing. I, I suppose it's, yeah. like you said, a very complex web of things that are happening there. But talking about youngsters, something that has sort of cropped up a little bit over the last while is how, how prevalent eating disorders are. And mm. is there some kind of a habit there or is there some kind of a uh, – can you talk to that a little bit? Um, I don't know if that's sort of involved at all with what you deal with. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, they're not uh, uh, like, you know, overweight and underweight. They're not kind of, although they are opposite ends of the spectrum, they're not because actually the etiology that's involved in being quite underweight is more of a clinical psychological um, issue. So it tends to occur for like large life transitions, um, you know, feelings of being out of control. Um, and often then people use food as a way to kind of gain back that control. Um, I've never done any research personally in that field um, because it, it's quite a complex field from a from a point of view of the clinical from clinical psychology. Um, so you know I got from my opinion, but I couldn't give you any um, you know stand up evidence on that. Um, I look at that quite differently actually the habits around that versus habits around just kind of more healthy lifestyle. Interesting, thanks. And, and Heather, uh, one of the other things that you talk about is uh, goal setting. Um, mm. Can you please tell us like if goal setting is a good thing or not? Mm. And then also what like sort of holds people back from sticking to their goals? Yeah, great question. Well, I, I, I'd love to know what you guys think. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think goal setting is important. I think it's important to have... Uh, something to strive towards. Um, mm. But uh, off the back of that, I think that people need to be conscious that a goal is only like a milestone and it's, mm. it's only something temporary that you reach. Yeah. And what you need to do is you really need to uh, be conscious of the journey to get to that mm. goal because that's actually where you learn all your lessons. Yeah. Um, so that's my thoughts on it. 
Yeah, no, I love that. That's absolutely, you know, my philosophy on it as well. Like, I think that, like we talked about earlier, like all too often people focus on that outcome, you know, like the Facebook likes or the X amount of miles run or, you know, X amount of number on the scales. Um, and, you know, they strive and strive and strive to get to that outcome. And when they get there, or if they find that actually they come to the realization that they're not going to get there, then they tend to just drop it because they feel like inadequate, they feel like they failed, everything else. They actually might have gotten quite far um, and they failed to appreciate, you know, in one of the studies um, that I had, you know, people that looked at their progress to date rather than how far they have to go tended to do better um, because they, you know, they were grateful for how far they've come. Um, but so many people, you know, when they set these extrinsic goals it's for external reasons, um, you know, outside of them, that tend to be quite performance or appearance based, you know, they're not that sticky. Like, you know, you tend to fall off the wagon. There's a lot of shame and guilt wrapped up in those type of goals. But on the other hand, if you set goals for intrinsic reasons, so like reasons that, excuse me, um, the goal is quite personal to you. You know, it's a goal that you've selected for yourself. Um, what's lovely is intrinsic found this out recently, intrinsic and trans, um, translated in Latin means goods for the soul, um, which, you know, I, and I love that because I feel like those, go those goals are goods for the soul. They're the goals that are based on, you know, who you want to be as a person, the characteristics you want to emulate, you know, what you want to represent in life. Those are the goals that are most sticky. And one of the very, very first things I do with my clients is I do a value exercise. I want to know, you know, what is most important to them in their lives and how that interacts with their goals. Um, for example, like I've seen a lot of work with um, the British Lung Foundation, and we've got people with chronic lung disease, um, COPD, um, and they don't tend to exercise because they're breathless enough as it is, and so being more breathless than exercise is very, very scary, and yet exercise is the primary intervention that's most beneficial for them. Um, so how do we get them to engage in exercise? Because there are people that, you know, typically have a really sedentary life, maybe have been sedentary all their lives. Hmm. What we do is we, we look at what their values are. You know, for so many of them, it's just to play with their grandchildren, to be able to walk to the bus stop and get a bus. You know, they want to be able to have that freedom in their lives. So if we start associating exercise, you know, with actually allowing them to do those things that matter to them most, that's when you start to get people interested. That's when you start to get them engaged. And also, those are the type of goals that keep you going in the trenches. It's not like, you know, using your willpower or trying to, you know, force yourself into it. It's knowing that what you're doing is, like, associated with that value goal. It's part of who you are. It's part of who you want to be. And that's what kind of keeps you going. That's what keeps you maintaining your goals. And then on top of that, you know, it's having kind of coping strategies, knowing what your barriers are, having plans to be able to um, overcome those. You know, there's also multiple other techniques, but I'd say the primary thing to start with is understanding what you value most and, you know, looking at how your goal interacts with that. Because it might be that your goal doesn't. And then is that really a goal for you? Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah. It, is there a is there a sort of blanket advice that you can give to people listening to this right now? Like, okay, you know, I want to, I want, I feel like I want to lose a few kilos. Let's say that's someone's mm. thought process, whether that's correct or not, remains to be seen. Then, is there some sort of basic place to start that everyone can, can kind of start with from that point? Like, whether it's a goal setting or the why. Maybe you could give a bit of advice on someone that's thinking they should or want to lose some weight. Yeah, um, great question. Um, I was actually going to make a really bad dad joke there, and I was like, my <laughs> my blanket advice is cashmere every time. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it wasn't a dad joke. It was quite yeah. funny. <laughs> no, we're definitely not editing that on art, so it's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I tend to stray away from advice. But I can give people kind of what, you know, the research has shown and what's worked best for my clients um, and reflect on that and they can reflect on that in terms of their own behaviors. But there's kind of like five key things that are really kind of good starting points for you. And we've talked a lot about them already, but yeah, associate a goal with your values. You know, make it relevant to you. Do it for you. Find out what the reasons are that are most important to you. Like, is it... You know, being healthy makes you feel like you're better at your job. It makes you feel like you're a better parent. You know, it makes you, you know, like health is a great value because it 
pretty much underlies everything that you do. You know, if you're healthy, you know, it makes you better at all the other things, um, you know, in your life. Um, so really dig into that why, you know, like Simon Sinek, you know, start with your why, understand your why. And um, the second thing is don't rely on your willpower, you know, um, you know, take those small steps. And I, I call them micro changes. So, you know, I ask people, you know, and this is some, something that people can do now if they're trying to um, achieve a certain goal, is um, what's the smallest step you can take this week towards that goal? So what's the smallest thing that you can do? And then I get them to rate that on, you know, zero to 10, with zero being, you know, the easiest thing possible and 10 being the hardest thing possible. And, you know, if they're, if they're thinking, you know, it, it's going to be really, really high on that scale, then, you know, take it down a notch or two. Um, for example, if you go back to the sugar example, you know, you're trying to, you know, giving up sugar, that's going to be really, really difficult. Um, having no sugar in your tea, if you've got two, if you take two sugars in your tea week, that's going to be really difficult. Maybe have a look at, okay, well, actually, at my 11 o'clock um, coffee or tea, I'm going to have a spoon and a half of sugar. And now that seems quite small, but actually, cumulatively, over the course of a year, that's going to be like 20,000 calories. You know, it's not that calories pounds, but pounds, but like, you know, it's a good way to quantify it. But actually, even that, like, it seems like such a small change, but it seems achievable. And once you get used to having a one and a half sugars in your tea, you know, then you'll, you'll start to get used to having one. And you're cutting down gradually. Um, so I say to people, you know, make that smallest change. And then the second thing is decide when and where that change is going to happen. Because if we put things into the context of when and where, it's much more likely that they'll happen because we're putting them into the real world. It's not an esoteric goal of, oh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, cut down on sugar. It's like, I'm going to put down on sugar at my morning cup of tea that I have at 11 o'clock in the office. So it's made it really, really concrete for that person. Um, the next thing I say is get get familiar with failure. Like understand what your key barriers are. What's going to get in the way of you being actually able to achieve your goals? Get really familiar with that. And then this is where the skill power, the planning power comes in. Come up with ways in which you can overcome that. So come up with different strategies. And you won't get it right first time, and that's absolutely fine. And because this is something that you're doing for the rest of your life, that's okay. It's an experiment. So what I say to people is. You know, if X happens, then what's your response to that situation? Because so often we just leave things up to chance and we think things are a freak incident or this temptation is just a one-off or whatever else it is. Um, and we let excuses take over or we let, you know, circumstance take over um, rather than actually saying, okay, well, actually this started to happen to me a lot. Okay, well, what are the alternatives in this situation? You know, if X happens, I will do Y. And they're called implementation intentions. And the research shows, you know, you're, you're two or three times more likely to stick to that goal. You know, if you write it down, you're two or three times more likely than that if you start planning your barriers. And then on top of that, if you can say, well, what is my coping response in that situation? And, you know, you might have one coping response. And actually, as you go through the week, you're like, oh, actually, you know, actually, that might be a good way of dealing with this. Um, so write them down, write down a few, experiment with what works, what doesn't. Because, you know, so often people say, okay, well, I'm always tempted to have, you know, chocolate at this time of day. And, you know, having chocolate is perfectly fine. There's no, like, you know, if you want chocolate, have it. But if you're having it because you're bored or you're having it because you're lonely or you're having it out of stress, then that's not a nice relationship to have. It's not a self-care uh, approach. But, um, you know, then try something else in that situation. What else can you do at that time? Can you go out for a walk? Okay, maybe you find actually going out for a walk boring. Okay, well, maybe that's not something that works for you. Let's try something else. Let's try a phone call. Let's try some, you know, each time, try something else, try something else, try something else. So often, you know, what we do is we say, oh, well, that doesn't work. Actually, that didn't work. And then we just kind of give up. But actually what we know is that persistence and that consistent and that context-dependent repetition, you know, that breeds a habit. So summarize that. You know, value your goal, start really small, small as possible, you know, and say when and where you're going to actually perform that goal and then think about what's going to get in the way and start to experiment with strategies in which to overcome that. And the last thing is have fun. You know, why, why do something if it's not going to be fun? Because you're not going to engage with it if it's mm. going to be fun. So make it as fun as possible for you. you know, so think about that habit, you know, if it's trying to go out for a walk in the morning, you know, can you listen to an audio book? Can you call someone that makes you laugh? You know, what can you do to add layers of fun into that? You know, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. 100%. Pretty much, uh, 
I think that's brilliant, like advice, like so many things people can just sort of, you know, straight away kind of uh, add into their lives. It's really practical too, uh, which is great. So to hear that, um, just before we kind of finish off here, we like um, our guests to be able to sort of plug themselves and, and what they're doing and stuff. And um, you're obviously working as a coach now and you have your own sort of uh, coaching habits program. And then you also have your own po- podcast as well. So if you just want to maybe let us know a little bit about that and then also how people can get hold of you and find out about um, yourself and your programs. Yeah, great. Um, so I, my website is drheathermckee.co.uk. Um, and on that you'll find you know, blogs and the podcast. So the podcast is called the Bite Size Habits Podcast. And it's all about very, very short podcasts, um, kind of, you know, reflective of the name it's all about bite size so it's about you know people that work in different areas of habit change or people that have you know a great habit change story um translating you know what works best for them translating the evidence um kind of giving you actionable advice that you can take home today and start taking action on yourself so you know behavior change is all about kind of taking action now and so that's something i'm really passionate about and you'll find that on the podcast um i work here in london i've got a clinic in gazelle house um, and I work as a habit coach there. Um, it's a beautiful place. Um, so, you know, if you're ever looking um, for just to even have a cup of tea, um, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful place. I feel very, very lucky to operate there. So I operate there face to face. And then the rest of the time, um, you know, I talk to people on the phone, so internationally. Um, and so um, I've actually got a thing on my website. If you want to chat about your own habit change, you can book a free 30 minute um, call and we can just have a chat about, you know, what your barriers are, what's holding you back and see if it's, you know, have a coaching and something that's right for you. And again, it's not, it isn't right for everyone, you know, um, and that's why I have these calls with people so they can really understand, you know, if it's something that um, fits this well for them or something that resonates with them. So if it is something that resonates with you or you think it might be useful for a family member, you can go pop on there and just book a free 30 minute call. Um, and then, yeah, you can just email me, old school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm info at drheathermckee.co.uk. If you've got a habit change question or, you know, I love to get suggestions for topics for um, the podcast or for blogs um, or for anything else. So I'm always really quite interested in that as well. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's my habit coaching work. And then I also um, work, you know, as a behavior change specialist for designing interventions. So if you, you know, if you're in a fitness or a health startup and you want some advice on, you know, how to help support people, you know, to get the best outcomes but maintain those outcomes um, long term, um, you can also get in touch on the same website. So that's all of it. Great stuff. Great. Well, we can we can only highly recommend people to go and check out your website and mm-hmm. and to see what what you've got going there because yeah, you're obviously super knowledgeable and the evidence based aspect of it is great. You know, people. It's so there's so much information out there, and mm. it's sometimes so difficult to just know uh, where can I get a resource where I kind of know this is the the leading edge of the the science, and I can actually implement the stuff knowing that it's not just some hogwash that's out there. So, um, you know, so we're very grateful for people like yourself that uh, bring that aspect the, the, of of the current science, uh, and knowing with your background that you actually know how to sift through. The, the studies because that's often quite difficult. So, uh, just from my side, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for sharing so much value. I mean, I was just blown away sitting there, <laughs> all this information. It was so Sorry. wonderful. Like I've, I've learned so much today. That yeah. was really good. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. I, I know everyone listening is going to feel the same way. Uh, and, uh, I appreciate, uh, yeah, the, the, the way you de- describe things as well with, with analogies and stuff, I think it must be a real pleasure to do coaching with you. So thanks for your time from my side. Uh, and uh, we look forward to connecting with you down the track. Oh, thanks, Greg. That's so sweet. Thank you. Really uh, appreciate cool. that. Really and, appreciate and from me, I, I just want to obviously say a big thank you as well. It's, it's nice that we kind of sort of eventually crystallize this and we got the podcast off and it's uh, good to sort of put a face to the voice um, after a year and I feel like we've literally just scratched the surface you know it's uh, this is something Craig and I like speak about all the time so 
you know, we, yeah, we, there's so much more, I guess we, we could have gone into, but it was like Craig said, so valuable and so interesting. And you have a way about how you explain things, which kind of just make, makes you want to listen more, you know, and like ask more questions and stuff. So um, I can only imagine that in terms of your business and, and where that all goes, it's going to go from strength to strength. Um, so yeah, just a really, really great, um, we'll have to book in another like two hour session at some point down the line to <laughs> go through the rest, rest of our habits and goal yeah. setting and uh, stress relief but questions. I, actually, I'd love to say thank you to you guys as well. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I told you I would do it at one stage, but um, I think what you guys are doing is really unique, you know, and I, again, it kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, it parallels with my philosophy of putting the person at the center you know, and, and that's what you guys are doing. You know, you're putting the person at the center and you're showing the different layers of their behavior and the ups and the downs and the failures and the successes and everything. And you're looking to take, you know, what are those lessons learned and, you know, sharing that with other people and helping them kind of understand it. And, you know, it's just an amazing platform for dissemination. And I love that you're just celebrating, you know, humans as they are, just normal, everyday people, you know, that have had, you know, exceptional or unexceptional lives, but you know, we've got something to learn from each of them. So I really appreciate you guys. So thank you. <laughs> so well said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That means a lot to us. Thanks so much. Yeah. And yeah, I think we just like through all our conversations, we just realized that literally there's a story within every single person you speak to. And there's, mm. there's so much value within their story too, for others to learn from. It doesn't matter if you're a superstar or if you're just a normal person like us, there's, there's just so much value in your own story that other people can probably sort of pull on and, and, and learn from. So I really appreciate you saying that. Thanks a lot. No problem. Oh, the lights <laughs> cool. have gone out. And the lights have gone out. So that's good timing. <laughs> 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 cool. Cool. All right. Okay, well, awesome. well, thank you so much again. It was lovely to meet thank you. Thank you guys. And I'm yeah, going cool. to uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so cool. yeah. 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 It was so, it was so, it was so, sorry to interrupt you. It was so funny. Like we, we went to the podcast conference and we, we were yeah. like, everyone's going to have t-shirts of their podcast. And like yeah. almost nobody had, it was yeah. only Craig and I, we were like <laughs> every single day, like three, four days yeah. with our t-shirts and like people were like, oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was like the perfect marketing opportunity and people yeah, it was so did cool, not yeah. take advantage. <laughs> and also now you don't have to think about what to wear. You can just wear the exactly. T-shirt. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. No more decision yeah. fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, thank you guys. It was, it was so lovely. Cool. cool. Yeah, great thank stuff. You. Cool. Cheers, Enjoy man. the rest of your day, okay? Thanks yeah, again. Thank you guys. Have cool. a great weekend. Thanks a lot. You too. too. Cheers. Thanks. Bye bye. bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cave.